Greetings everybody. This is an older post, but I'm reposting it because here is the Day of Atonement. This Bible study is going to be a little different. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Day of Atonement. If the calendar is correct, and I don't know if it is, I know the Roman calendar that we use, the Gregorian, the calendar and all that stuff is incorrect. In the Bible, the start of the new year was in the spring. You know, that's when you planted the crops. And, you know, you had different holidays and holy days, as it were, in the Bible. And this particular one is for the Day of Atonement. The Jews call it Yom Kippur. And Yom means day. Some will say, well, it means an age. This way they can slide in evolution. But the thing is, the word atonement means, in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and I, I can't say enough good things about Webster's 1828. Guy was a linguist. He was a theologian. Guy knew not only what words meant, but where they came from. I mean, the guy knew Greek, which is what the New Testament was in. He knew Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament was in. The guy was a scholar. Atonement. Spelled A-T-O-N-E-M-E-N-T. -E -E Look at, break that word down. A-T, at, O-N-E, one, and then mint. At one, mint. At one, with God. Okay, it means an agreement, concord, reconciliation. You know what reconciliation means? It means you have a fight with somebody and then you, you, you make up. That's reconciliation. Reconciliation after enmity, which is hatred, or controversy. See Romans 5. It also means the satisfaction or repar uh, reparations, you know, paying for a debt, made by giving an equivalent for an injury. You know, for example... Um, if you stole something from somebody that was worth twenty dollars and then later after you stole it you give them the twenty dollars back that's you know making satisfaction or reparations uh, let's see in leviticus 9 and moses said to aaron go to the altar and offer thy sin offering and thy burnt offering and make an, an atonement for thyself and for the people all right, so in theology, it's the uh, expiation of sin made by the obedience and personal sufferings of Christ. So atonement in for our sins, the atonement for our sins in the New Testament was via Christ. In the Old Testament, it was by the blood of bulls and goats, which only covered sin. It didn't wash them away. So, on September 23rd, if the calendar is correct, and I'm not even sure the Jews' calendar is correct because I heard Hillel II changed it, and then there was people that go by the lunar calendar, which there's some good evidence that, that is correct. I don't know. One day Christ will come back and he'll tell us all things. But until then, I don't know. Because... The Levitical priesthood was trained from the time they were children till the time they were 25 years old. I mean, you're talking they probably had 20 years of training on just this very stuff. Now, so now we know what atonement is. So let's take a look and see what it is. Leviticus 16.34 and this shall be an everlasting statue unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. So on September 23rd at sundown is the day beginning of the day of atonement. Okay. 
Uh, here we go. Here it is. Leviticus 23, 27. And on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you. That means a day of no working. And ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Well, the offering by fire doesn't apply anymore. So, but what it was is this day, a holy convocation was like a vacation day. You don't work. And afflicting your souls. It was to be a day of fasting and prayer. To sit in sackcloth and ashes, reflecting upon all the wicked things that we had done that offended the Lord God of heaven. For he is a holy God, and we are unholy, sinful creatures. That's what the Day of Atonement was for. So, and then you got these, uh, the Jonathan Kahn people running around, and, you know, they're talking about the Shemitah, or the Shem, sh sh whatever, you know. But uh, Leviticus 25, 9. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. Shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land? Okay, so the day of atonement was a day for us to reflect back on all the things that we had done to offend the Lord and to feel sorry for him. Okay, so that's what the day of atonement was for. It was to be a holy day, a holiday, a day of no work, sackcloth, ashes, fasting, and prayer. Now, if, indeed, the economy does collapse uh, this September, just know this, that just remember the tribe runs our money supply. They own and run the banks. They own and run the Federal Reserve, and paper money always Fails. Every country that's ever gone to a paper-based money economy, the economy's always collapsed. And they can collapse the economy anytime they want. If the economy does collapse, it doesn't mean that Jonathan Kahn was a prophet. It just means he was an insider that knew what the plan was. Okay, so that's my opinion. And yes, I took business and economics and accounting in college. So I know how economics works and when you got paper money all you do is you keep printing paper until it collapses and every single one of you that's got a mortgage on his house guess what there's a clause in your in your mortgage that the bank can call the loan so if you owe fifty thousand dollars on your house they can call the loan and say you got to give us fifty thousand dollars in cash by such and such a date if you don't we take the house back and if you don't have the money, guess what? You lose the house. Well, this is how it works. Fractional banking. Um, they, they take in a dollar and they lend out 90 cents. Then that bank takes 90 cents and they lend out, you know, 90% of the 90 cents. And then, you know, 80 cents. And then they lend out the, you know, 10%, 90% of the 80 cents. And then on and on and on. So you get $1 and you're lending out like $10. But there's only $1 in the bank. When you start calling loans, it's a house of cards. It all collapses. So if this shimita or shimita or, or whatever this little nonsense is, if it collapses, it's planned, people. It doesn't mean Jonathan Kahn is a, a prophet of God. Okay? So don't don't fall for it. Because my opinion is this messianic Judaism stuff is a Trojan horse. And I hope you'll listen to this to the end, the end, because I'm going to tell you about what the Jews really believe on Yom Kippur. They got a thing called Kol Nidre, K-O-L-N-I-D-R-E, two words. And we're going to talk about that later. All right, in Romans 5.11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So, hopefully you got an idea of what's going on here. The uh, I'm not saying 
Christians have to keep the Day of Atonement. Uh, it's just, you know, it's something that they did back in... People talk about the Hebrew roots. Well, this is, that's Hebrew roots, the, uh, the Day of Atonement. So, uh, let's see. So let's take a look at the, what goes on on the Day of Atonement. All right, let's take a look at what the Jews do on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Uh, this Kol Nidre, K-O-L-N-I-D-R-E-I, -E I've also seen it spelled K-O-L-N-I-D-R-E. You know, the Jews always have several different ways of spelling things. It is considered the holiest of Jewish prayers. This is the holiest of Jewish prayers. All right, so let's, this is the Chabad group, C-H-A-B-A-D dot O-R-G. You know, the Chabad group, that's the Lubavitchers. Those are the ones that, uh, whose rabbis suck on the baby penis after the circumcision. Let's read, uh, why is Kol Nidre considered the holiest of Jewish prayers? While Kol Nidre, a prayer wherein we release vows, you know, promises, they release promises, vows, is certainly traditionally seen as one of the most important prayers of the year. There is little in Jewish literature to support this idea. The question, however, remains, why does Jewish tradition, tradition, lend so much weight and solemn, solemnity to this seemingly technical prayer? There are those who have claimed that the reason goes back to the days of the Spanish Inquisition, when the conversos, Jews who chose to convert to Catholicism rather than face expulsion or death, but remained faithful to Judaism at heart. Uh, let's see. So they would gather on Yom Kippur Eve in their hideout synagogues before beginning the Yom Kippur services. They would tearfully and emotionally entreat GD to forgive them of all the public statements they made in the previous year, which were contrary to Jewish doctrine. Sorry, uh, Mike Hoggard. I had to borrow a page out of your... Uh, playbook there. Uh, so let's take a look at the Jewish prayer of Kol Nidre Ooh, and read this solemn prayer. This is from the JewishEncyclopedia.com. It's the full unedited text of the 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia it can hardly be considered anti-Semitic. Here's how, here's the prayer, and I quote, In the tribunal of heaven and the tribunal of earth, by the permission of God, blessed be he, and by the permission of this holy congregation, we hold it lawful to pray with the transgressors. Okay, and then... Um, uh, the the cantor will say the the words kol nidre, okay, and then they will repeat three times the following words, and I quote: "All vows, v o w s, that's promises. All vows, obligations, oaths, and anathemas. Uh, those are curses. Anathemas are." Curses, whether called conum or conus or by any other name, which we may vow or swear or pledge, or whereby we may be bound from this day of atonement until the next, whose happy coming we await, we do repent. Okay. May they be deemed absolved, forgiven, annulled, and void and made of no effect. 
that they may not bind us nor have power over us. The vows shall not be reckoned vows, and the obligations shall not be obligatory, nor the oaths be oaths. Do you catch that? Any vows, promises, obligations, oaths that you vow, swear, or pledge are to be bound from this day of atonement until the next one. They're to be absolved, annulled, made null and void, and to be made of no effect. Remember in elementary school when you'd make a promise and you had your fingers crossed behind your back? And you go, well, I didn't make that promise because I had my fingers crossed behind my back. Well, that's what this is. Basically, what the Jews are doing is saying that any promises that they make from this year to the next don't apply. Mm. So they repeat this three times. Now, if you don't believe me, just read this, you know, read it. This is the wisdom of the Jews. And not just the regular Jews. You know, I tell you what you do. In the newspaper, when it comes out, look in the religious section, look at the nearest Jewish congregation and, and look for the Kol Nidre ceremony. They have it every year on the Day of Atonement. And it's not just the Jews that don't, supposedly, that are non-Messianic. Even the Messianic Jews do this garbage. You know, this is why I have, I do not trust when, when Jews tell me they're messianic, I'm like, why would you do this kind of satanic stuff? Oh, yes, God, any, any promises that I make from this year to the next are null and void. So when you work for a Jew uh, and he promises to pay you after you do such and such a thing and he doesn't pay you, he didn't commit a sin. He told God in the temple before all his fellow Jews, every promise that I make. I'm not going to keep it, and it's not a sin, because, you know, I had my fingers crossed. Yay! Yeah. Yeah, that's... And, and this, this is right out of Babylon, right out of the Babylonian Talmud. Mystery Babylon the Great. And, uh, you know, you wondered why Jesus... Uh, condemn them for all their traditions. Do you think this wasn't around in the days of Jesus? Oh, yeah. Listen to this. Uh, Matthew, this is why the Jews hate Jesus. That's why they call somebody Yeshua, because they hate Jesus. Matthew 5.33, again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. Ye have heard it said, I'm sorry, again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. In other words, if you make a promise, you keep it. Okay? But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now, don't you remember in the Kol Nidre thing? Uh, it said, in the beginning, it said, in the tribunal of heaven and the tribunal of earth. See, Jesus knew darn well what this stuff was. He says, don't buy, swear by God, heaven, don't swear by the earth. Hmm. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, verse 36. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay. In other words, yea means yes, and nay means no. So if you say yes, mean yes, and if you say no, mean no. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. 
You see, Jesus knew Kol Nidre. It was back in his days. Oh, yeah. This is the wisdom of the Jews. And even the Messianic Jews do this garbage. So, you know what? Don't trust. When a Jew tells you they're Messianic, ask him what the Messiah's name is. And when they tell you Yeshua, run. Yep, Kol Nidre, people. Even the Messianic, so-called Christian Messianics, whatever, do this stuff. It's amazing. All right, so I'm done with ranting and raving. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that light of life is Jesus. In his precious name, amen.